Hi there. Um, my name's Amita Kervalani and welcome to the Wheeler Centre for a conversation with Kate Cole Adams and Kate Leslie tonight. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we uh, meet here on the traditional land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulam Nation. And I'd also like to put forward that for me an, an acknowledgement of country is about the fact that this was and always will be traditional Aboriginal land. Um, Kate Cole Adams's book, Anesthesia, the gift of, obl of oblivion, the mystery of consciousness, is the subject of our conversation tonight. So Kate is uh, a journalist and her first novel, uh, Walking to the Moon, was published also by text in 2009. So Kate Cole Adams is in the middle and Kate Leslie is on the other side of me. I will be using your full names, I'm sorry, the whole night. Um, <laughs> but it'll be obvious, I hope, who I'm You could always to. just call me KCA. <laughs> That's too hip hop for me, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Kate Leslie, um, Professor Kate Leslie is a specialist anaesthetist and head of anaesthesia research at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. She's a prof professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne and at Melbourne University. So please help me welcome them to the stage. Um, it feels quite special to have them both on stage together, oh, you're mine tonight, um, because Kate Cole Adams uh, interviewed Kate Leslie for the book and you feature in the book as well. Um, and that is because, as some of you may know, um, Kate Leslie and her research partner, Paul Miles, uh, I like to think of you as the Beyonce and Jay-Z of the anaesthesia <laughs> research world. Um, but we will get that to that in a minute. Um, and I, I also should say that uh, we do a lot of talks at the Wheeler Centre, as most of you will know, and I really elbowed my way into this interview seat because I am absolutely in love with this book and totally fascinated by what you both do and think about. So, I'm going to throw to the biggest question I could possibly think of to start with, just to start in chaos. And I want to ask you both, what is unconsciousness and what can it tell us about consciousness? Now, before you answer, punch my mic out of the way, um, I want to say that let's return to this as we go along. Let's start out wide and then return to it. I might... Go, Star, yeah. I don't actually have an answer, but I'll give you an answer of sorts. Um, you know, the question, what is unconsciousness and what can it tell us about consciousness? It sounds so lovely and neat and um, kind of nicely wrapped up. And, and I feel like I should have that answer. But uh, really, all, all I can say is that we don't know what unconsciousness is is really, I mean, you, are, you ask, or at least different people have different versions of what it is. You know, you ask uh, an anaesthetist what it is, you ask a psychiatrist what it is, you ask a doctor what it is, uh, and I, you, you'll get you different... You ask a journalist what it you is. You ask a journalist what it is, you'll get a lot of confusion, but you'll get different answers from everyone, and I suspect within each of those categories, you're also going to have different answers. Um, so what's unconsciousness? It's what consciousness isn't. Uh, what's consciousness? Well, no one can agree. Uh, you know, we don't know. I mean, th and there's been a huge amount of research I in the last couple of decades. And, you know, we're closer to having a sense of what happens in the brain. And, and, but we don't really know what consciousness is. So, to me, the, the sort of question, and this is one of the things that fascinated me in... in um, you know, kind of tumbling into this book that I, I then kind of spent a decade or more in, um, w was kind of going, well, if, if we don't know what unconsciousness is and we don't know what consciousness is, I mean, A, A, it interests me how you do your job, but we'll get on to that. But I, I guess for me, it, and, and without sort of being flip about it, it seems to me that there's, it, it's not an easy question, there's not an easy answer, and to me, the most interesting parts of that answer are in the kind of space between uh, what is clearly conscious and what we would say is clearly unconscious. And one of the things that surprised me in the research was how much grey there is in between the two. So, Kate, Leslie, how does that resonate for you, the space between that being a kind of definition for consciousness? Uh, it resonates quite well. I mean, there are two key features, scientifically speaking, about consciousness. One, one is that the person is awake, so they, uh, they appear to be not asleep, they're awake. And the second thing is that they have a sense of self. So they have a, a feeling that they are a person. 
So that immediately gets you into a discussion about when um, a new life becomes uh, conscious. You know, are babies conscious in utero? You know, or when in development babies become conscious? And, and whether, you know, people at the other end of life with dementing illnesses are conscious if they're awake, but they've sort of lost the, you know, the, that sense of self. Um, and then there are other states like dreaming. So clearly when you're dreaming, you're asleep, but you still have a sense of self because all dreams are dreamt in the first person. So is that something different? And then there's a sort of, you know, friends of mine can meditate and can transport themselves to, you know, different um, universes, you know, doing, the, doing that type of work. And they're, they, they're not in a, a completely conscious state as we would believe it either. I'm interested in, we'll return to this, of course, we can't mm. not. But I'm interested, I feel like everyone has a story about anaesthesia and I'm interested in asking both of you, this is, as you say, a life's work, the book, to some extent. You've been, it's been rolling around in your mind for so long and you've been spent 10, 13 years researching. Uh, look, I did the first interview for it in 1999, so it's been a, it's been a while. A while. Yeah. And I'm interested if you, do you have a story about what drew you to this area of medicine and why you've, why you've stayed there? Uh, well, I liked it because um, when I was a young doctor, I liked the team atmosphere in the operating suite. And so it wasn't you weren't just sort of sitting in an office, you know, with just you and the patient. There were a bunch of people around. But I also liked the... I'm a woman of action. I like, you know, you draw up the drugs, you get everyone, you put the person to sleep, you do the operation, you know. And um, I like um, dealing with crises and dealing with difficult situations. And I also like that this, this bit about it, doing research on it, because there's so much that we don't know about what's going on while people are asleep. I'm interested that, um, Kate Cole-Adams, you're an anaesthetist, anaesthetist uh, they return in, they've returned in your work numerous times, the, the husband of the protagonist in your novel. And, and so I'm interested what... what what drew you there initially? Yeah, look, it, it, it's an interesting question. And, and you know, again, I'm, I'm just going to spend a lot of tonight saying, look, I don't really know. But, um, you know, wh when people ask me, well, why did you, you know, a, a, a sort of, you know, a sociology major who failed maths uh, decide to spend, you know, 15 or so years of your life investigating anaesthesia? It's a cool club, the failing maths club. Yeah, I, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've got about three different answers and uh, the first answer was that in 1999 I met a woman who'd had the experience of waking uh, under anaesthesia and it was the sort of the full, um, kind of the full nightmare scenario. Mm. Uh, she'd gone in for a seizure and she woke on the operating table fully conscious, fully paralysed and in enormous pain. Um, and, I, and I talk about that story in my book, and I also talk about... Um, she's an amazing woman. Her name's Rachel Benmayer, and um, one of the things that fascinated me was what she actually did with that experience and and also what happened to her mind during that experience. But um, I, I sort of realised relatively recently that actually I'd been preoccupied in this area for much longer, and I'd kind of done... You know, I'd done feature stories on uh, coma and locked-in syndrome and sort of unconscious, sort of the ways of the body unconsciously signalling distress. Uh, and I'd written a novel that was about a woman who'd just woken up from a coma who was married to an anaesthetist. So clearly there is something going on <laughs> in my kind of, you know, I would say still fairly unconscious processing. Um, yeah, and I, I was going to say something else that had struck me about that also was that when I, you know, when I... Actually, I might get back to that later. I'll allow it. Huh? Um, yeah, I'll well, allow it. Um, okay, good. I, Maybe. I'm interested that you don't mention your the work of your grand, grandfather here. That was and you I never was do. Mentioning. Yeah. I, w I want you to talk about it if you won't. If you oh, mind. Okay. I, I, all right. I will. No, no, no. I really do. I, I, I mean, I, I sort of find there's so many things in this book that it's like, well, which bit to pull out? And and 
It was only, I mean, you know, when we had that conversation the other day and you asked about my grandfather and I said, oh, yeah, I never even talk about him. But one of the, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that really interests me in the whole conversation about anaesthesia really, and, you know, I'm not a scientist, I don't understand how it works. Uh, you know, I spent years interviewing people and looking at them thinking, I, I really have no idea what you're talking about. But um, part of my job as a journalist was to try and make that into something that made um, some sense. But I, I'm... I'm very interested in the idea in thinking about what people actually take, what we as individuals take with us into an, into an anaesthetic and the fact that we're not just a patient, that we're an individual and we have our... We, we, so we bring to each anaesthetic our own psychology, our own um, personal history, our own culture. Uh, and also increasingly, as I wrote, it really sort of struck me that we also bring our kind of antecedents, we bring our genetic inheritance, we bring the sort of pers people we are and, and the sort of people our, our family are. And all of these things kind of make a difference in terms of how, I mean, it makes a practical difference, which you, you know obviously more about than I do, but in my understanding is in how people actually respond to an anaesthetic. But, um, sorry, that was a very long prelude. Just when I was, when I was researching the book, and really right towards the end when I, w I was kind of um, scrambling to sort of, you know, I, ha I, had a, I had a proper deadline at that point. And I opened up a cupboard that I had, I, you know, that I, I knew was there, and there was a manuscript in there that I knew was there, but that I had not looked, I didn't remember looking at it at all. But um, when I opened it, it was my, uh, my mother's father, my grandfather's manuscript, and it was his effort. It was basically a book that he had spent... Uh, probably 15 years of his life working on um, an unfinished book, uh, which was all about consciousness. So, yeah. And you do tell some of that so beautifully in the book and his description it, of thwartings, I really yeah, remember. It was, it was very so uncanny and it was very... I, I sort of felt quite emotional about it, really, because reading his book... He seems so familiar to me, and I was like, and I kept on thinking, "Oh, you poor bugger! You've spent all this time on this book. Oh, this must be doing your head in." And then, and then he died young, so he never got to finish the book. So I kind of, yeah, I really liked pulling a bit of him in as well. Um, you mentioned uh, during that description what occurs to. There's a question about what occurs to the body and the mind under, under anaesthetic, and I thought because we have Kate here today, would you be willing to step us through that process and, and, and also the conversation that you have with the patient once they're on the table? Well, uh, we, we normally meet the patient before they get put on the, you know, the slab. <laughs> the slab. <laughs> um, and we talk to them about their health and, and, and what we're planning to do and what, what their expectations are and so forth. And increasingly... Um, we're teaching our young trainees to, to really get more into finding out what people want and seeing if that, those wants can be met. Um, so when we pop you on the operating table, we attach all the monitors up, up to you and, um, and then we usually give you a pain-killing drug and, so you, and you start to feel a bit woozy and that's a drug, uh, it's like heroin, it's, it's morphine or fentanyl. And, and then we, um, we slowly give you the uh, propofol, which is the drug that we use to put you off to sleep. And it's not sleep, I should say that, and uh, the president of the college, David Scott, will be very cross with me for using the word sleep. But we use the word sleep because it's comforting and people understand it. But anaesthesia is completely different from sleep. Anyway, so normally uh, you'll feel a burning pain up your arm from the propofol. That's comforting. The Hmm? Comforting? And not very, usually. Just, we can do things about that, but the, um, that's the drug that, was, uh, that killed Michael Jackson, propofol. But if you have a highly qualified anaesthetist like, <laughs> <laughs> like me giving you that drug, then you, that's much better. And, uh, and then we're usually... We don't do the count to ten thing anymore. We usually just try and, you know, chat to you about something nice and, you know, and then... And then off you go, and it's the most lovely feeling, or that's what a lot of people think. Other people don't like it. They feel like they're falling into a black hole of, you know, what risk and fear and so forth. But we try to get over that. Then after you're asleep, uh, we pop something in your mouth to help you breathe. 
And um, we might put that further down your throat with the use of a drug that keeps you still. And those drugs were first came from South American arrow poison. Um, they're curare drugs. And it was those drugs that actually led to a, a sort of an epidemic of awareness in the middle of the 20th century. Mm, which Kate details in the book in, yeah. in detail. Yeah, amazing detail. Yeah, so mm. essentially these drugs do three things. They, they make you lose, you know, you, they make you become not awake. You are unconscious. Um, they make you um, make encoding new memories are usually impossible or very difficult. And, um, and they do other things like um, affect the cardiovascular or the heart uh, system and the lung system and so forth. But it's very interesting that they don't disrupt everything. So they're quite specific. And why they are like that is not known and is, a, is an area of a lot of research. So in the sort of getting into the kind of you know creepy metaphysical stuff that <laughs> that, that we likes, love <laughs> that we love, um, it's um, it's it's uncertain whether you know your sense of self or your real identity or your soul or whatever is anesthetized along with the with those other bits of your brain, mm. because lots of the networks in the brain are still keeping you your body ticking over, you're renewing all your cells and you're getting older, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, so that's what's happening while you're asleep. And then at the end, we uh, turn everything off and reverse drugs with various antidotes and, we, uh, and you wake up. And sometimes people remember the things that we've got in their mouth being there the, as we take them out. Most of the time they don't remember that. So most people wake up in the recovery room under a nice warm blanket with a you know, highly skilled, kind recovery nurse, of whom there are many in the audience, um, um, you know, looking after them and then and go off to recover, you know, get on with recovering. I'm interested in what you found is a, a really big fear that patients have when they meet you initially. What, what are they worried about and do you think that's justified or...? Well, most of the patients are concerned about the outcome of the surgery. And, you know, they don't, most patients don't really know much about their role at the anaesthetist or the anaesthetic nurse who's helping the anaesthetist or the other people in, in the operating theatre, what their roles are. So then most people are rightly concerned about how the operation will go. And then some people are concerned about the anaesthetic, um, People don't seem to worry so much about not waking up, but they want to wake up with all their faculties intact. Um, they don't want to lose marbles in the operating theatre, and they, you know, they don't want to have a heart attack or a stroke, or if they're me, they don't want to vomit mm. <laughs> afterwards. Um, it's a bad look. Um, I want to ask both of you about Kate. You've done a huge amount of research for the book about anaesthetic awareness, and and in in lots of ways the book revolves around the instances which are not so high and, and Kate Leslie you just mentioned that I think it's one to two in a thousand is that right? Yeah look I mean it really it really depends there's various different ways of measuring but sort of big um, studies similar to what um, you and Paul did although you were doing it with higher risk all higher risk patients but um, sort of big studies where you actually wake people up and then you you give them uh, questions uh, it tends to be one or two in a thousand uh, recalls something of, of the operation, but it would be a much smaller percentage who actually um, would have an experience like like Rachel Benmayer's. Mm. Um, do you do you want to describe um, describe that or perhaps the Hank Bennett um, account of the the black stuff as a, as a way to kind of describe how anaesthetic awareness um, manifests? Well, I mean. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's interesting because, I mean, there's so, many, there's so many different ways that you can be aware in the same way that there's so many different ways that you can, you can be conscious. And, you know, one of the things that's really struck me uh, sort of, you know, really since doing the book, well, I mean, while I was doing the book, but also since, is the number of people. I've been on radio quite a lot and every time I do a radio slot, at the end of, the, you know, at the end of that slot, the switchboard is completely full of people who are ringing up and they've got stories to tell. Um, and they've got stories to tell and on the whole they've got stories to tell about um, 
you know, most of them are not very happy experiences. Uh, and occasionally, and you know, and I've had a couple of really, really heartbreaking uh, letters and emails, uh, you know, particularly from women who, who like Rachel, had um, caesareans. I mean, there's there's some procedures where, because of the procedure, you, you're at higher risk because um, you can't be given as much anaesthetic. And one of those is caesareans because uh, you don't want the, the drugs to go through to the baby. But, uh, you know, I've had a couple of women who, from the 80s, with horrendous experiences and sort of describing you know, kind of, not only the the, the sort of agony and, and um, the, the waking, but, I mean, the powerlessness is really profound and that's what actually really creates the PTSD, which is very common in these situations. Um, but also, there have been, a, a, you know, far more sort of less um, sort, of ex sort of dramatic examples. And, you know, I, I kind of... And there was one recently, and this woman sent me this lovely card which was sort of saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and she was saying, oh, look, you know, I was really confused about my, my um, surgical experience recently and I felt really kind of crap. And, and I, you know, and, I went, and I've been seeing a psychologist and she's not helping and your books really helped me make sense of what happened. But when I actually asked her more about what had happened... The, the odd thing was that she had actually been aware. It was, she was having a pacemaker inserted, and heart surgery is another one where, uh, you know, awareness is a bit more common. So she had actually woken during that surgery. She'd been in pain. Uh, she'd heard what was happening. But that wasn't what was really troubling her. What was troubling her was the conversation she'd had with her surgeon beforehand and her feeling that he hadn't listened to her concerns and that she'd been pushed into the surgery faster than she was ready. But she said she was so anxious about it that when they left the operating room just before they were about to begin, she actually tried to get off the table. Um, and she said that when she woke up, they kept on telling her that she'd, she'd needed five times more anaesthetic than, than normal. Now, I don't know, Kate, is that a thing? Is that... It is a thing. Um, but That's the it, technical <laughs> term, yeah. Um, what you've described is one of the biggest problems that we as a, as a profession and, and as professionals have with this issue, which is that pacemaker insertion is usually done under local with sedation. So the first step is to make sure that the patient understands that that's what's going to happen. Oh, OK. Right? So she wouldn't have actually so been under a general... the other big procedure that where we run into this trouble is colonoscopy. So people um, uh, think they're going to have a general anaesthetic or that they won't, be, that they won't remember anything. And, and then when they do remember something, they think they've been aware. So there's all these different experiences on a continuum of remembering just a tiny little bit and not really caring about it to having a really distressing experience like Rachel did. Mm. And the main thing is to, for us as anaesthetists to make sure that patients understand uh, what, what is supposed to be happening. Mm. When one of, so I was just going to say really quickly, one of the things that really struck me and that there was some relatively, some quite recent research um, which was that George Mashur, um, where where they they basically they were sort of they discovered the same thing that they were talking to people who had supposedly sort of been you know woken under anaesthetic and they discovered that actually quite a lot of them had never been meant to be fully anaesthetized anyway they were basically being deeply sedated uh, but they hadn't understood what would happen. However, the translation from their experience to PTSD was almost identical yeah. to if they'd actually woken under, under, in the middle of the surgery. And so, you know, one of the things that, that struck me is, well, from the patient's perspective, it makes no difference. Mm. Uh, you know, what you're left with is an experience of um, powerlessness mm. and terror. And, you know, and the thing about those sedative drugs is they, they kind of... They're disassociative too, so you start feeling a bit wacky and people can get really, really scared and it's the fear, mm. you know. And, and, and one of the things that interested me was that actually, although obviously in extreme cases where people really can feel everything, uh, it's kind of like torture and, you know, it's just like you don't want your plane to fall out of the sky, you don't want that to happen to you occasionally, they, they do. But, um, but the, the, the real, you know, people can actually put up with some pain, it's not as much of an issue as feeling um, completely bewildered and completely powerless, mm. um, which is why these conversations, I think, are really important because, 
you know, my, from my perspective, it's really important that people have an idea that this sort of thing can happen because simply discussing it actually means that your outcome may well be much better. I mean, that's my perspective. Does that? Abs you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Good. Dr. Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Kate. <laughs> Professors Kate. Um, I, that made me think of the fact that um, Kate Cole Adams, you told me, Kate, Leslie, you speak right through the surgery to the patient the whole time. And the, and the, the, don't speak a, to them continuously, well, or the surgeon. Yeah. It's not just we have annoyed. I I do talk to pa the patients that are under my care, um, especially when I think they might be uh, a bit too lightly anaesthetised, and you know, and particularly sometimes in the middle of the case, we have to manipulate the things that we've got down their throat or whatever, and that's very very stimulating. So I usually say I'm just, just fiddling with the thing in your mouth, it's all going well, and tell a, tell a few fibs like, operation's nearly over, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a great um, an experience like that, which has actually been published, so I can, I can say it without, you know, invading anyone's privacy. We were doing a, a research project about dreaming under anaesthesia, and um, we had a patient, in, and I was actually, she'd been, was on my list. So towards the end of the operation, the, the senior surgeon handed the instruments to the junior surgeon and left, which is, um, for the anaesthetists in the room, a time when your heart sinks. <laughs> and then, so, there's so, so I'd mistimed the end of the anaesthetic a bit, and the patient started wriggling around. So I said, don't worry, you know, her name, everything's okay. And I gave her um, a, a shot of propofol. And she instantly, be, you know, her bis value went, this is an EEG thing, went like way down and she was deeply anaesthetised. And so my research uh, nurses interviewed her afterwards and she said, oh yes, I had a dream. I was going along the road in a fast car, I think it might have been an ambulance, and then all of a sudden the road opened up in front of me and the car sped and went into the hole, the black hole in the ground, and I heard you say, don't worry, everything will be okay. <laughs> and I said, what a fascinating dream. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, it's a couple of hours later she didn't remember it. Mm. So the question, the ethical question is whether I should have told her that she was awake or not. Yeah, that is an interesting question. Did you? Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> uh, you know, what goes on tour stays on tour, I think. <laughs> Kate, you describe plenty of studies where there's a, a kind of ethical quandary at the heart of them. Are there any that you that come to mind that you'd like to talk to? Well, yeah, I would, yeah, there there are several. I mean, there's a there's a really kind of I, I say famous, and the reality is because it's got to do with anaesthetics, it's not really famous because, as far as I can work out, no one knows anything about anaesthetists or anaesthetics. It's like this kind of blank spot, and in fact, the most famous anaesthetist in the world who's in this book and who. Kate also um, has met, died recently, and there was this kind of galvanising silence. It was like, okay. Um, I've forgotten your question, sorry. <laughs> well, I'm interested in some of the studies that you talk to in the book. Oh, uh, the, 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 so one of the kind of, the, the, the sort of seminal study was, uh, was done by a guy called Bernard Levinson, who was a... Um, uh, young, then youngish South African psychiatrist, and he decided he was very fascinated. It was it was the 60s, and he was very interested in the whole idea of unconscious processing and this idea that maybe you could hear and take in information while you were while you were anaesthetised. So it, it being the 60s, he basically you know sort of buddied up to a dental surgeon who said, sure, you know, sure, I'll I'll stage a fake crisis uh, among my unwitting. Um, you know, uh, surgical patients tomorrow, and and they did that. And halfway through their, their these guys' surgeries, they were under anaesthetic. Suddenly, the anaesthetist stopped and said, "You know, uh, you know, I don't like the uh, hold on. I don't like the patient's colour. The patient's looking very blue. Uh, you know, general consternation. Quickly, let's blow the breathing bag. Sounds of breathing bag." Uh, and then, oh no, look, everything's terrific now. They're they're doing really well. Uh, you know, drama over. And when the patients woke up, 
you know, they asked them how everything was. It was all fine. Do you remember anything? No. And then a month later, Bernard Levinson um, interviews them in his in his rooms in Johannesburg. And he hypnotises, he sort of hypnotically regresses them. And hip, hypnosis is a whole other thing um, and has weird parallels to, to anaesthesia. But uh, under hypnosis, half of them actually remembered verbatim uh, parts of the, all or parts of the crisis, the, the fake crisis. So that kind of raised all sorts of interesting questions. And, and it was a very flawed study in various ways. But it kind of... Um, it. it, it you know, there have been quite a few studies since then looking looking at this kind of phenomenon and wondering whether people can actually, you know, these aren't, you know, like, like the experiences we've been talking about uh, up until now when people actually wake. I mean, that's not actually an anaesthetic. That's a failed anaesthetic. But the, the, there's the really... And I find this so fascinating, that sort of whole area where it's like, well, yeah, but if you're properly anaesthetised, uh, can you take in information? And... Um, and and there've been quite a you know there've there've they've been quite a few all admittedly quite small studies, but that have shown um, that yes you can but they can't test anymore like they did they can't stage fake crises anymore because it would be unethical. Mm. Um, so now they kind of tend to say really boring things like you know you'll be unconscious and they'll sort of just say apple pear or. Uh, you know, what is the blood pressure of the octopus or, or kind of stuff like that, which, you know, why, why would you necessarily remember that anyway? Um, but there was, there's a guy called Hank Bennett who I, who I met in um, 2004 uh, when I kind of uh, almost accidentally landed in a very strange anaesthesia conference in Hull in northern England. And um, he'd done something, he, and he's a bit... He's a bit wacky, but he's he's a lot of the people in this area are. A but bit I wacky. knew you were going to say that. But he's not. They're not. He's, they're he's, not. Well, his interest. He's a very intense person. He's quite an emotional person. But he had done some really interesting, some really interesting studies. And you know, one of these studies were was he um, got people when they're anaesthetised and uh, just sort of towards the end of the operation, he kind of whispered in their ears, you know. When you wake up, I want you to. Um, I want you. This is very important that you remember what I tell you. And um, what I would like you to do is, when I speak to you next time or whatever, uh, I want you to let me know that you've heard me now by touching your ear. I think it was his, his ear. And 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 he had a theory that that actually the sort of learning that might happen during anaesthesia might not be verbal, it might not be the sort of learning that we're familiar with, but that actually there might be kind of um, non-verbal memories. And, you know, and... and uh, Sure enough, th th that was the outcome of that study. Y and do yes, we, we, do we count that as a hypnosis? But, th was that a, do we, a hypnotic... Do we consider that Hank Bennett was um, performing a kind of hypnosis on the patient or, or is that a whole different game? I actually can't remember what his interview... Um, ha whether his interview was... Hyp no, I think it was a hypnotic regression. Yeah, mm. it was. It was. I mean, the, the whole hypnosis question is just so bizarre. But, I mean, you, you can actually do an entire... You can do surgery just under hypnosis. Uh, have you tr tried that? Kind of no. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that I, I'm not I, a believer. But, but You're it, not you a believer. Can't not believe it because it happens. <laughs> or not a believer in actually doing it in your operating theatre. Yeah. I'm interested yeah. you say this, Kate, because um, in my mind, the, the speaking to the patient, not constantly, but throughout the surgery, I read that in the book as as a I mean hypnosis might be a dirty word to you but um, it's not a dirty word but but I I read it a little like that but you don't consider it um, similar. I'm talking to the patients because uh, for two reasons one I um, as a leader in the operating room I want everyone to treat the patients as a person while they're having their operation. But secondly, just in case they actually are retaining things that they will remember later. So there's no doubt that, that touch and sound and pain and taste and sight and hearing, they all go in. It's all getting into the brain stem, the primitive part of the brain, but it's not getting anywhere else and it's not being consolidated into a memory that you'll have later on. Because you mentioned the memory blockers that occur. Yes, yeah. yeah. So there's, lot, there's lots of small studies and some of them I have done myself and um, I, I think the, the jury is out about whether you can learn 
under, anesthesia, under adequate anaesthesia. And I, I suspect that you can't, but I'm, I'm hedging my bets. Mm. And, yeah. so and also, how can you tell whether someone is always under... How do you know if someone is adequately anaesthetised in any moment? And I know... So, sorry, Amita, but, but no. the, the, you know, when I met... Kate, you, you were doing this this kind of amazing study, you know, the superstar study, with um, or the study that kind of made turned you and Paul into um, Jay Z and Beyonce, um, but which was basically uh, a kind of doing doing a sort of testing this this new, uh, uh, and I know it was you very carefully didn't call it a consciousness monitor, but it was yeah. like a sort of depth of anaesthesia monitor so to see whether you could consistently measure how deeply underneath people went. Because really up until relatively recently, you, you would rely on, on sort of the way that the patient, you know, the sort of patient's vital signs and maybe the way the patient sort of looked. But, of course, once you're paralysed, it's very hard to, um, uh, you, you know, yes. it's much harder to get signals. Mm. And, and also if your patient, uh, you know, partly because of the drugs, can't remember what happened anyway. You're in this real, real quandary, uh, apart from the fact that, um, you know, consciousness is completely subjective. So what do you do? <laughs> so uh, we, we, we address it from a population perspective and an individual perspective. So we give doses of drugs that are, uh, have been shown to be effective in most people, in most situations, and so we're pretty mm -hmm. confident that we're giving them enough. And then secondly, we use all of the information that you've just told us, you know, blood pressure and whether they're moving and all that kind of thing to work out if that, if that matches up with if this person is a typical person or an atypical person. But the EEG or brainwave monitors that we use, we stick them on the forehead. It's like a kind of a Band-Aid thing on their forehead. Um, uh, the audience will now realise that measuring this front part of your brain is... You know, who knows what's, whether that bit is the same as what's going on in the back bit or in the middle bit or, and whether that's reflecting the disruption of the networks that really matter or not. And the answer is, it's not. So, it's, you know, it, it helps, but it's not the, it's not the panacea. Um, we've talked about memory formation and I want to talk about pain. So I think the quote in the book, Kate, is that, oh, from another anaesthetist is, um, if, a, if a tree falls in the forest and lands on your head, do you feel it? Mm. But I do want to talk mm. about pain and um, under anaesthesia and, and memory of pain. Mm. I was kind of really fascinated by this. And, and because I sort of feel like, you know, I walked into this whole conversation, you know, a, a, sort of a bit like, you know, the fool in the tarot or so. I'm just kind of like, oh, this looks interesting. And, and then I sort of just found myself getting deeper and deeper and deeper and the whole pain thing really fascinated me and I, and I, I, I don't actually understand it. But, um, the, you know, the, what, I, I was really interested in that whole question and also, you know, the fact that actually, I mean, the thing about pain and the definition of pain is that pain is, is a combination of, A, the messages, the sensory messages you're kind of receiving from, you're receiving from your nerves and also your conscious um, sort of clocking of that experience. So, uh, by definition, no, you can't feel pain under anaesthesia. But you can experience something called nociception, which is basically what, which is equivalent, well, which is basically pain that you don't know about. So the conversation about unconscious pain is really interesting, and and you know, and there's certainly been been um, you know sort of studies that show that it, it it's not a good thing anyway because it can be linked to chronic pain later on, but also. Uh, there's sort of questions, I think, about whether it actually pushes people towards consciousness. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm interested it's, in hearing, Kate Leslie, what, how, is it pushing, is, is pain a, a symptom of pushing people towards consciousness? Is that how you'd describe it? Um, well, so Kate's right that when you're under general anaesthesia, you don't um, have pain because pain is the conscious experience of nociception. And nociception is you know, the bits of your body that are telling your brain that there's danger or injury. And if you're having a very painful operation, you need more anaesthesia than if you're having a not very painful pr procedure. So, yes, so that's why sometimes people are aware when the, when the surgery suddenly gets a whole lot more painful and stimulating. 
There's two reasons to uh, treat pain well during the operation. One is that it reduces the amount of the anaesthetic that you need to give, which is which is great. But the other thing is that um, if you treat pain well when it, while it's being created, then you've got a much better chance of not having pain afterwards. So we give, you know, most of us now give four or five different pain-killing drugs during the anaesthetic. Uh, we do nerve blocks and epidural blocks and that kind of thing to try and stop pain. And then there's a sort of ethical question mm. about, you know, if you are offered the 100% the safe drug that knocked you out, but you remembered the whole, the pain of the whole thing, you experienced the pain while it was going on and then didn't remember it afterwards, would you mm. accept that drug, you yeah. know? And the answer is no. No, well, they no. actually did a, did a survey, the group yeah. of um, anaesthetists in, in England actually had a survey on that because an American anaesthetist had, had suggested, um, and uh, he was being a bit sort of intemperate with his language, I think, but his, his argument was, well, look, really, actually, maybe in terms of measuring anaesthesia, what we don't necessarily need to... Maybe we should stop worrying about whether people are conscious or not. Maybe we should worry about whether they remember or not. And that argument was because, basically, you don't want to anaesthetise people too deeply because those drugs have other potential effects on the brain. So... Uh, but, but, you know, there was, there was a group of anaesthetists in, um, I think, Bristol who immediately did a staff survey, sort of saying, OK, well, if you had the choice of being, you know, sort of, you know... Well, I'll, well they asked various questions, but culminating in, you know, th that very question, uh, would that be acceptable? And, like, 97% said no. And I thought, well, who are the 3% who said <laughs> yes? <laughs> Um, Not from Bristol, perhaps. Um, before no. we go to audience questions, I do. Uh, I promised Kate Leslie that we would talk about the structure of the book, and I mean, it is also another question about pain for you, Kate Cole Adams. Oh, for Kate Cole Adams. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because this was a wrestle. You wrestled as you mapped and oh, yeah. learned, and I wondered if you could talk about that process because this I, I've been at pains to describe exactly what this is I mean this is a, a kind of personal topology to some extent uh, yeah. yeah and when did it change from a work of journalism to a, a memoir or a hybrid of yeah, various well, genres that, that was probably in about the sort of over the decade between when I first met you and when I, I, I did, I mean, I, I was fascinated in, the, in this topic, but when I set out, I actually, because my background is in journalism and I, and I, I just finished this novel, which was really hard work. And, and I thought, oh, I'm, you know, what, I'm going to do nonfiction because I get that. And that's going to be really straightforward. So um, uh, I, I really, really struggled with this book, partly because um, partly because of that struggle, I think, and I think journalists do struggle with that, and particularly we're taught to think and write in a certain way, and the idea of kind of injecting, uh, you know, the, the sort of I in any um, significant way is, is kind of um, uh, upsetting. Verboten. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's sort of more allowed, but it's so hard to get the balance between kind of being present and being a complete wanker. And... I spent a lot of, you know, I probably spent, if you looked at all the years I spent on this book, I probably spent, you know, one entire year wondering and worrying about that particular line. But um, I, think, I think for me the, 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 the reality was that this book just really took over and this book started announcing to me the sort of book it was going to become. And it became very much, you know, the parts of me that were trying to be in control and that was trying to be, you know, my conscious self was just constantly, and, and for years, was embattled with my kind of unconscious self. And, you know, and, and the result of that was a combination of kind of depression and uh, anxiety and really bad dreams, uh, some of them about anaesthesia. Uh, so, you know, in the end, I kind of really, I, I was sort of forced to accept, and I do, you know, I mean, this is a book about anaesthesia, but for me, the, the real decision about moving away from it being a straight... Um, sort of reportage book was, to me, that was much less interesting than um, trying to do a book that actually, I mean, the way it's structured, the, you know, I wanted to create something that, that included in the structure both the conscious parts of ourselves and the unconscious parts of ourselves, and that also felt like the way a mind works. And, and so that kind of idea of sort of moving around between things and bouncing between different kind of 
aspects, A, really appealed to me and B, it was really the only way this book was ever going to get finished and I had to finish it because otherwise I would be like 90 and I'd still be doing it. So, uh, yeah. Would you like to read just a little section? Yeah, sure. Don't we, have, have we got a minute? We've got a minute, yeah. Let's do okay. it. All right. All right. Well, I've got various... Um, I've got various bits, but I might um. I might just read that bit that we we mentioned before. Okay, this is, the, the, this this section is um in the middle of a a, a kind of um, a, a part of the narrative where I go I where I sort of find myself well I, I take myself but to this um anaesthesia conference in in Hull and it was very early in the research and I really had no idea why I, I was sort of fascinated but what am I doing here, and I. When I sort of got there, I, I basically ended a, f a fairly extended... I mean, what I look at now and go, well, it was a fairly extended panic attack. But uh, back then, I didn't really know what was going on at all. Uh, so this is sort of halfway through the section where I write about that. Um, I'm afraid of dying. I know this is unremarkable, but I think about it a lot. How can someone be here and then not? How can that ever make sense? It does my head in. When I was a child, I tried to lie awake and wait in wait for the moment, the actual instant, when I would cross from my waking self to that other. I think I believed that if I could only capture the intruder, sleep, I would be able to prevent it running off with my thoughts and all the other things that made me feel like me. My parents, who both started practising early with the deaths of their own parents, have often seemed to me pragmatic to the point of fatalism about mortality. I grew up assuming they'd be dead or close to it by the time I hit my 20s. I worried when they went out that they would not return. I imagined car crashes and roof collapses and absence and loss. Anesthesia is not, I understand, the same as death, although sometimes it is. It was for Michael Jackson. But it feels like death. Not so much the experience, although who knows, but the fact of it, the extinction of self, that worries me. So does the idea of being paralysed and the idea of being buried alive. Not, of course, that your doctor is going to bury you alive, but to be paralysed and unheard. And, of course, the idea, not just the idea, the certainty of losing control. There was a stage in my life, probably a too long one, when I liked to lose control. I liked drinking, I liked roller coasters, and I liked getting on aeroplanes, buckling up and relinquishing myself to the ministrations and constraints, the hot face towel the regimented geometric meals, the little screen halfway up the aisle showing obscure or yet-to-be-released films. This was the olden days. The destination set and irrevocable. On a plane, I would enter a kind of trance, a perfect passivity born of the almost complete absence of options, so that each little choice seemed delightful. Chicken or beef, red or white. All the while hurtling through a strangely unreal sky, day, night day, perhaps towards some distant, more perfect version of myself. I think that was it. I loved it. Until one day I didn't. I was in my late twenties in a plane en route to France when I became aware of an unfamiliar unease that quickly coalesced into dread. Belted into my narrow seat in that inexplicable metal cylinder, what terrified me was not that the plane would plummet or explode or hit another plane but that any second now, unless I could exercise an unthinkable degree of control, I would start to scream. I could feel my hands and feet twish, twitching with the need to leap up. My throat shrank with the effort of staying silent. It seemed to last hours, though the worst of it was over by the time we stopped to refuel somewhere in the Middle East. There I accosted a Frenchman and begged for one of his cigarettes. He gave me two, which I smoked in succession, drawing the hot, grimy air deep into my lungs with gratitude and relief. I have no idea what I would have cried out if I'd ridden, risen to my feet in the plane and started to yell. But for some years after that, whenever I entered an airport, I would begin to feel the same sort of spiralling incapacity as now enveloped me in the anonymous hotel room in Hull. This is a special way of being afraid. No trick dispels wrote poet Philip Larkin in his tart, sombre rumination on death or bard. Larkin spent most of his working life in the Bryn Mawr Jones Library at the University of Hull, where the conference was now being held. I don't know how many of the anaesthetists knew the poem. It wasn't mentioned in the conference material. No sight, no sound, no touch or taste or smell, 
nothing to think with, nothing to love or link with, the anaesthetic from which none come round. Thank you so much, Kate. Those, that poetic mapping of the self, is, it runs right the way through the book for me and, and, and paired with the science and, and the studies that you speak to are incredibly meaningful, I think. Um, let's turn to audience questions. Um, we've got two ushers, one on either side. Uh, and just raise your hand if you, if you have a question. Hi, um, this is a question for Professor Kate. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could... Um, talk a little bit about the difference between being in a coma and being anaesthetised. So, um, comas can be drug-induced or not drug-induced. Uh, drug-induced comas are, are, in fact, general anaesthesia. So, sometimes um, on the news you'll hear things like they've got Michael Schumacher in a drug-induced coma and he's under general anaesthesia. And then there's uh, comas which are due to brain injury. And, and they're uh, not reversible in the same way that, that general anaesthetic comas are reversible. And they will only get better by a long process of recovery. Hi. Um, just another question for um, Professor Kate. Um, what is the current thinking about the link between um, uh, anaesthesia triggering, triggering Alzheimer's disease? Uh, this is a very interesting question, which I'm glad that you've raised. Uh, a lot of um, people um, fear losing their marbles when they have an anaesthetic. Um, people in, in most of the of middle and young age need not worry at all. Uh, it's mainly a problem that afflicts the very young and the very elderly. And there's a lot of work going on uh, at the moment in Melbourne about the effect of anaesthetics on, on babies and their development. But let's talk about the other end of life. So um, a number of things happen to older people when they have anaesthetics. Um, they take longer to wear off, so that's the first thing. They don't tolerate the pain medicine as well as younger people, and that make, make them a bit dotty. So part of the, the early phase of, of what we call delirium in older people is drug-induced. And then there's a, a kind of... I, th I, I say to the relatives of my extremely old patients, you know, your mother is going to lose a few of her marbles around the hospital, and she's probably not going to find all of them. Mm. And so... There's, um, there are some effects of probably long-term effects of the anaesthetic that is um, work that's ongoing and it's not been confirmed at all. But there's the effects of the surgery. So anaesthetists always blame the surgeon for all of the problems and the, the surgeon blames the anaesthetist. But the stress of the surgery can be overwhelming for older people. And then another um, thing is that qu quite often people have been getting by at home uh, by themselves and then they come into hospital with some type of injury and um, they're, they're out of the closet. You know, they can't hide the fact that they've got a dementing problem and everyone, their relatives and the doctors and everyone starts to recognise that. So that can be blamed on, on the surgery and the anaesthetic but it's actually just part of a long ongoing dementing process. So there's stacks of research being done about this at the moment. It's one of our most active areas. Mm -hmm. This is not really a question, I suppose it's more of a comment. Um, it, as a child in the 40s and 50s I had to have a number of anaesthetics and still remember the mask over your face where they dripped, I don't know, chloroform or something chloroform hideous. Chloroform or ether. ether. Yeah. As a nurse in the 60s we had patients who vomited intractably, you know, after every anaesthetic. Now we have the luxury now of, for most of us that anaesthesia is so skilled in such an amazing science that you know, you wake up and a couple of hours later you're not feeling too bad at all. It mightn't be perfect, but by God, it's a hell of a lot better than what it used to be. Yeah, my father remembers having um, his tonsils out on the kitchen table in their country, ta you know, their country home and under ether. And people never forget, um, they even can smell the ether when they drive past hospitals. Mm. Yeah. Well, same with my father, who I think is here somewhere. Um, it's clearly one of those memories that just stays. And in, yeah, yeah. Mm. My, my father-in-law remembers um, 
going under ether as a young child and he he feels that he did have an a, an awareness incident um and and he's it's he's had flashbacks since so yeah that and the smell is just mm. so mm. and I, I in the book you you cover the fact that the auditory the sounds are the things that that go last yeah. when you're under that they're the things that remain and yet we've talked so much about the visions that people have and the dreaming that they do and I find that really interesting that whereas it's actually the sounds that are the things that are kind of remain mm. well I mean I suppose it's the, it's the same in in the process of death as well that you know and in in coma that that you know hearing uh, and I'm sure there's all sorts of reasons that I don't understand about how that work, works in the brain, but hearing is the last sense, is the most um, resilient sense, in, in mm. a sense. I'm not sure about that. Okay. I mean, I don't but know. But we think that's the case. Um, Kate, you, you, in the book you talk about that the dying, um, that process where the, that studies have shown that... Um, studies have shown, I promised I wouldn't use that phrase, um, that the... the Electro, the electric activity in the brain that's occurring, that, that it can sense sound. That do you remember the study that I'm kind of referring to? Uh, uh, no, I'm not. I'm, well, yeah, you, I did. No, I, I may have made the it specific up. Study, but I, I think one of the things that really, in, you know, once I've kind of relinquished to this not being a, um, you know, a sort of popular science book, uh, one of the things that really fascinated me was the transitional states and the sort of, you know, conscious to unconscious but also then the kind of process of, you know, and realising it's not a switch, it's a process, and which may include a number of switches, but also looking at the process of death and, and wondering about that. And some anaesthetists have done some um, research on that. And, um, you know, and, and there is one study in there towards... I'm not sure if this is one you, one you mean where where it was the study on, this is the rats, is this the yeah. same? Yeah, so this is right at the end and, um, yeah, and they kind of realise, that it's, it's, a, oh, look, it's, a, it's a lab rat story and it's a bit sad, but uh, various lab rats who were hooked up for some other study but their, mind, their, their brains were um, hooked up, a couple of them died overnight and they accidentally and they realised in the morning when they looked at the brain waves that there'd been this enormous kind of burst of brain activity uh, just after what would have been death. And so, you know, one of the kind of... And because, and you know, this book became a very personal book for me and and in the last stages of writing this book, my, my mum was in the process of... of um, she had cancer and she was in the process of her her dying and her eventual death. And so those kind of questions became increasingly important to me, I think, and that kind of sense of, well, who who are we? And, um, you know, and that, so I suppose to me that, that, well, what the hell, you know, what does that even mean that the brain goes kind of completely bonkers when you're you're meant to be dead and and sort of and this when they look at it it's sort of like super consciousness i mean the the, the number of kind of connections but it might not be super consciousness it might just be bzzz. I don't know. But I like the way it makes me think about how we talk to each other when we talk to each other, the fact that Kate Leslie talks to her patients throughout um, yeah. and 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 that we talk to 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 our family and loved ones as they're dying and that, that that's not a wasted kind of effort that they potentially no. hear us. And, mm. uh, you know, I mean, for, for me, you know, as a, as a non-medical um, professional, you know, the, for, the one takeout for... I hate that word, I just said it. <laughs> but anyway, for me, the idea of communication is really, really important. And so many of the stories I heard... Uh, even the ones that couldn't have been solved would have been really helped by effective communication. And I think, as you say, Kate, actually, um, you know, your guys are getting much, much better at that. We hope so. Yeah. yeah. You described them as a kind of well, guardian angels in the operating theatre, and I think that's true, all of your monitoring and talking, and it's important work. Well, that's the way we'd like to think about it. That you know, you're not alone when you're un you're not alone when you're under the anaesthetic. Kate Leslie yeah. will now sing a song. You're no, no, thank um, you. <laughs> we have run out of time, unfortunately. Um, Kate Cole Adams will be signing books at the back of the room, um, and thank you both so much for going there, going under with me. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, 
Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.